Nearly 3 billion people live on $2 a day or less in our world. 1 billion of those people are living in desperate poverty. 45 million people, or 14.5% of Americans, lived uh, at or below the poverty line uh, last year. Every week, someone comes to our church office or calls asking for money, for financial help. Can you pay our rent? Can you pay the electric bill? We need food. And every week I see people, you know, at exits or entrances to freeways asking for money and homeless people on the streets in Portland. What are we supposed to do with the materially poor? Uh, what is our attitude to be? Uh, what was Jesus' attitude? What did Jesus teach about the poor? Uh, if you think of some questions uh, while I'm talking, save them to the end and I'll, I'll take some questions. This is the fourth in the series of messages, What Did Jesus Mean? We're looking at things Jesus did or said and asking what he meant. So the text today is John 12, 1 to 8. There are Bibles under every seat in the room and, uh, or you have your phone or whatever you want to use. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Now, this was a big deal. Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. News of that had spread all over Judea. So if you got an invitation to come to this dinner party honoring Jesus with Lazarus there, you were grateful. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with them. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. This is a lot of perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Now John, who's writing this gospel, uh, is one of the closest disciples to Jesus and gives us a little insider information. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, replied, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So that's the question. What does Jesus mean, you will always have the poor with you? Does he mean, hey, look, there are always going to be poor people in the world. It's such an overwhelming problem. There's not much you can do about it. Or did he mean, yes, there are always going to be poor people, but what Mary did was right in focusing on me because in a week I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be crucified. And clearly he meant the latter. What does Jesus think about the poor? Well, let's look at some verses. Luke 4.18 tells us Jesus came into the synagogue and began to teach, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. His very first line says, I'm going to pro pro uh, proclaim to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. In Luke 6.20, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Why does he say that? Well, something about the poor are more receptive to God than the rich. Luke 7.22 uh, John the Baptist was in prison. He sent a message to Jesus and said, Are you the Messiah, the Son of God, or are we to look for someone else? So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor." He quotes from Isaiah 35 that clearly says this is that he's the Messiah, the Son of God. 
Some people say, uh, does Jesus ever say he's the Son of God? He says it right there by, by using that passage from Isaiah. And the last line is to proclaim the gospel to the poor. Why does he single them out? He cares about everybody, doesn't he? But there's a special concern about the poor. Luke 14, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor. It's the first group he mentions. The crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Luke 18, he's talking to the rich ruler who comes and asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replies, you still lack one thing, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Uh, I am the rich ruler. As an average American, I'm closer to LeBron James economically than to the billions who live on $2 a day or less. Well, what about after Jesus ascended into heaven? What about his followers? What did they say? Galatians 2.10. This is when uh, Peter, James, and John, the leaders of the New Testament church, met with Paul. Paul had become a convert, and uh, they agreed that Paul would go and preach to the Gentiles, and Peter, James, and John would focus on the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And... Uh, but they wanted to make it simple for the Gentiles to come to Christ, but they gave one requirement. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I have been eager to do all along. Why did they mention the poor? Where did they get that idea? From Jesus. Obviously, his concern passed on to them. James, his half-brother, Kid brother, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. He says, Haven't, hasn't God chosen the poor to receive the gospel? Why does he say that? It's because the poor tend to feel their need for God more than the rich they more quickly understand, I can't do life. I need you, God. And then James again, he was the leader of the New Testament church. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? It's remarkable how God so identifies with the poor that he says in Proverbs 19, 17, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for what they have done. It's appropriate that we look at other verses in the Old Testament because Jesus talked about the scriptures as being all true, all inspired by God. Proverbs 14, 31, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Don't ever show contempt for people materially poor. God so cares about the poor that he says this in Leviticus 19, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. I love this verse. If I was a farmer, I would make sure I got every grape, every strawberry. I would I'd want to squeeze every dime out of that harvest. Remember, I'm Scottish. <laughs> God says, don't do that. You miss it on the first run, you leave it for the foreigner and the poor. Deuteronomy 15, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land your Lord, your, the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. You ever been hard-hearted or tight-fisted? 
Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts is near. See, every seventh year in Israel, they canceled the debts of the poor. So what happens if it's in the seventh year and a poor person comes to you and says, uh, would you loan me some money? What do you know right away? You're not getting paid back, right? It's going to be canceled. But he says, don't think that way so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you and you'll be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Here's that same land again, line again. Therefore, I command you not to forget about them because there will always be poor. Therefore, I command you be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Psalm 69, the Lord hears the needy. Psalm 113, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Psalm 140, I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. Okay, is it obvious? God loves the poor. He identifies with them. He has special concern for them. He not only identifies with them, he sent his son poor. Jesus was born in a manger. He was homeless. He didn't carry a mortgage. At his death, his clothes were sold. They may have been the only clothes he had. And then he, at his death, he was put in a borrowed tomb. So God has special concern for the poor. What are we to do with the poor? How are we to help the poor? Our church is very generous. Whenever we ask for gifts to the Benevolence Fund to help poor people or for Christmas baskets, you folks give very generously. When we take an offering for the orphans, orphans overseas, the poorest of the poor in the world, you folks give very generously. We send backpacks home filled with food every week. You supply that. America as a nation is generous. America has given more individually and nationally to the poor than any other nation in the history of the world. But are our efforts helping? We measure activities. How many food baskets did we fill? How many clothes did we give away? How much money did we raise and give? Instead of looking at outcomes. Take Haiti, for example. Since the uh, compassion boom toward Haiti over the last 40 years, $8.3 billion has been pumped into Haiti prior to the earthquake in 2010. And another $8.3 billion has been sent there since then. Yet the people of Haiti today are 25% poorer than they were 25 years ago. That's a destructive outcome. That means our, our poverty uh, alleviation is not always helping. But the poverty is deepening. That means when we look at things like welfare, are there ways for people to get out of welfare and get out of poverty? Is there a path? Or do they become a permanent underclass? How's it working? We have to. To look at that. I think about our Christmas baskets. Every year we you know, hand out 60 or 70 Christmas baskets and our family's experience and I've heard this anecdotally from some of you has been something like this. The moms are thrilled. You, know, you walk in, they're thrilled. The kids are delighted to open their presents but the dads are nowhere to be found. And not just because they're a single parent home. I've, I've seen the dads go out the back door. Why? They're ashamed. They can't take it. It's too embarrassing that they can't provide adequately for their families. So is there a better way to do it? A few months ago, Bob Baboski gave me a copy of the book Steve Corbett and Brian Fickert, When Helping Hurts, How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor and Yourself. I mean, the title is provocative. 
how to alleviate poverty without hurting the poor. What? And yourself. By the end of the introduction, I was angry. They suggested that, uh, that the church is not doing enough. I thought, come on, we're doing these Christmas baskets. We do the, the backpacks. We, 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 we help when we do things over there at the school. We pay for it. We give to the orphans. And then they suggested, and many churches are not doing enough. And then when they do, they do more harm than good. I thought, what? So I read on. By the end of chapter 2, I was underlining every other, every other line. Upon finishing the book, I was a convert. I'm not the only one. They've, it's sold over 300,000 copies in publishing circles. That's good. It's used by several large churches like Willow Creek, Saddleback Church, and um, uh, LifeChurch.tv. I quote that all the time, Craig Greshel. They use it as their platform, their philosophy of how they outreach into their communities. The book can be summarized in four propositions. One, poverty is not simply a matter of material resources. If you believe poverty is just a matter of material resources, what do you do? You give them money. You write them a check. You give them food. You put them on welfare. You pay their rent. The authors argue that people of all socioeconomic backgrounds often lack one or more of life's essentials. The wealthy can struggle with one of these four essentials just as much as, as the poor. That's why it's important to understand that if you don't and you step in and say, well, I'm going to help you financially, you, you know, I know how to do it. And you can come in with pride rather than recognizing you too may be missing it on one of these four essential relationships. The first relationship is a right relationship with God. We were created by God to be in a relationship with God. When we don't have that relationship, things will not sync up in our lives. That's why it's important when we think about helping the material poor to, to first help the people inside our church. And when we do help people outside our church, we invite them to come and hope they will come because that's got to be part of this whole process for them to be restored in these relationships. Two is a sense of self-worth. This is their relationship with themselves. Often material poor feel like, you know, they don't have a job. They don't have a sense of self-worth. Three, healthy relationships with family or community. God built us to have relationships with people. He built the family as the unit to make this world go. And often, materially poor have been cut off from their families. Maybe they're kicked out for addictions or whatever. And then four, an ability to work productively. This is our relationship with creation. Uh, this might involve education. It might involve training and ability to interview and look for a job. The second proposition is solution to poverty involves walking with people. You don't just do things for them. You don't just write them a check. Uh, the authors suggest when someone comes and asks, you, you don't want to make the first thing you do is cut them a check. You want to understand them and how they're doing in these four relationships. Uh, this means it'll be time intensive. My guess is if you're going to work with somebody and help somebody, it's going to be a commitment of about six months, maybe once a week. You're going to partner with them on a plan. Let's, let's get a plan to lower your expenses, raise your income. You're going to partner with them with community organizations. They, they say, well, the church doesn't have to have everything going for it. There are all kinds of organizations. So the first thing a church should do is identify who are the organizations helping the poor in the community. I mean, we have the Oregon Food Bank that gives out more food than any other organization in Oregon. Well, they're just, you know, 10 minutes away. What are the organizations that, you know, that work with immigrants, that help people find jobs and help people train people? And we, we need to know all these things. 
Third proposition is all people have resources that can be used to change their situation. Everybody has something. They have skills. They have abilities. Outside resources can build on what's already there but should not supplant it. And then the fourth is overcoming poverty requires that person's direct involvement in the decision-making process. People own what they participate in. They help make a plan. If they don't help make a plan, it's not going to work. They have to be part of it. My guess is, with a, within a one-mile radius, certainly within a two-mile radius, we have a number of people living below the poverty line in this area. And as I read these, uh, I did, maybe I didn't say it, Bob gave me three books. There's, there's the one I'm quoting here and then two sequels. And I've become convicted that God wants us to do more, do something to help the materially poor. But I hesitate because I think it's going to take a lot of people. So today we're offering books. It's kind of a hollow offer today. They all sold out the first hour. So we'll have some more next week. But I still want you to go to the book table and sign up that you would like one. We're offering them for $10. And uh, I'm partly looking for who's interested. You know, I'm guessing there's a couple of you out there. Your heart's beating so fast. You say, I was made for this. I want us to do something. And, and by how many of you take books, I'm gauging how big an interest there is in our congregation to, to, to make this a major you know, ministry of the church. It's going to take an investment of people, and then eventually it's going to take an investment of dollars. Just to say you don't write a check the first thing when somebody comes in doesn't mean down the road they hit a point where they say, i got to pay my mortgage now or I'm going to lose my house. You know, we, we have to step in at some point. When we think about what Jesus teaches about the poor and see his huge concern for the poor and observe that 3 billion people in this world live on $2 a day or less, and 45 million Americans live at or below the poverty line, our tendency is to throw up our hands and say, it's overwhelming. What can we possibly do? I'm helped by Andy Stanley's statement he made just recently, do for one what you can't do for all. I think that's a good line that helps us with all our ministries because almost any ministry we do, we can get overwhelmed. We say there's so many people materially poor, it's overwhelming. There's so many people in prisons, how can we help them all? You know, you just, just go down a list of uh, what, you know, there's so many people that, you know, are immigrants in Portland, foreign students at Portland State. How can we serve them all? But if you think about, well, I can probably help one, which is probably what it will involve. If you step forward and say, I'd like to be part of this ministry, you're probably volunteering to serve one person, one family for a period of time. All right, questions? Who has a, uh, wants to probe this? Just raise your hand. Um, I was just wondering, uh, so many times you know, when you pass the poor in your car, they come to your window. Um, Sam will say, or this is my husband, he'll say, get a job. And that's kind of mean, you know. But I know in his heart he probably doesn't, you know, but he just. And uh, some of these individuals, you know, are they are um, on drugs, as we've seen. So there are systems wherein they can... You know, but we still should have um, a heart for them, correct? But, right. But we're hurting them by helping them. Right. So that's, that's the almighty question. Right. Well, we certainly know we're not supposed to be hard-hearted. 
So if you're convicted of that, get that one. Uh, we do need to help, but knowing how to help, that's what this book is all about without hurting people. And uh, okay, what's the right way to do this? And what's not the right way? Linda. I kind of listen to what God, I, I pray about it. And if I see somebody that God urges me to go give some money to, that's what I rely on. I don't rely on my human All right. uh, way of doing things because we're always greedy, we're always selfish. And so I have helped people in the past and I will continue to do that if God gives me that urge. That's great. We ought to pray about everything we do in life. So uh, be led. Dale. Just a quick comment. Um, there's a gray area of, as Marianne and I have experienced in the past couple of years, between enabling and assisting. Right. And that's what's so difficult. Right. And those four rules are, are good rules, but just all of us have to search, as, as we said, between enabling and assisting. And yep. we struggle with that every day. Good point. Yep. Maybe one more. Connie. Um, I think that there are many forms of poverty. So for us to think about um, other things other than money and material things, and so many people are uh, poor in relationships and attention and love. And I, I was talking at Bible study about the nursing home where my mother was, and I spent quite a bit of time, and I watched how few people had visitors. And so I'd like to encourage people, you know, I know Ron is, uh, has some ideas about how we can help people who are struggling, but it isn't always material. <laughs> and just giving some time, or I know I feel that same um, confused feeling when I take a uh, exit on the freeway and there's somebody there asking for help and um, and I tend to just turn away and try to avoid eye contact and ignore it <laughs> but you know my daughter who has had struggles in her life um, she said she re often reminds me mom you don't know their story you know, it may be that, that they are meth addicts or alcoholics, and, but you don't know their story. And so I, I'm trying to um, find other ways to um, make them feel loved. And um, I'd like to challenge all of us to do that. How, how can we help beyond material help? How can we just make somebody's self-esteem grow, feel better? about themselves in whatever situation they're in. Right. Well, and that's one of the main points I think this book is making, that it has to be more than just material help or you will not solve, the, you will not raise them up on par. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son into the world. You became poor so that we might become rich. You died for our sins so that we could be forgiven and have new life, have your Holy Spirit working inside of us make us the people we really want to be. Now, Father, we're going to give to you of our material resources. Thank you for this as a way to show, express that we love you, and that we trust you, that we give to you, trusting you'll take care of us financially. We pray for those who are looking for work or looking for better work. Father, we uh, pray that you'd multiply what we give and help us to serve Portland and serve this community right where we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, and Lord, we pray for our children. We, uh, we know the truth that 95% of people make commitments to Christ before they're 18, and so we pray for our children and our teenagers that they would turn to you. Uh, we know that uh, it's a difficult world uh, to grow up in, and there's so many... Um, 
alternative ways of looking at life and temptations. And so we pray that you would give our young people strength to commit to you and stand for you in a world that disagrees, or many do. Uh, so, And then we pray for parents, the task of raising kids today and discipling them. Give them wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.